Hi, I'm Don Marisa Lace with NS2022 Neurodiversity Conference, and I am here with Lisa Kwok. She is a clinical neuroscientist studying the brain-body connection in neurodivergent people, which makes me really excited. She has a, a focus on hypermobility, and that's something that uh, I have more recently come to understand a little bit better, but I'm excited to learn more from Lisa. Um, I've begun to understand my own hypermobility. I didn't know it was like a thing. I, I just like, you know, when you're little kids and you're like, hey, can you bend your thumb back? And can you like do this with your fingers? And <laughs> right, like I didn't know that meant a thing. Um, and I would get really jealous of the kids who were more hypermobile, hyperflexible than I was. I'm like, oh, you can like fully bend your knees backwards. That's weird and I love it, right? So, <laughs> So, and if you're kind of like me and this is all new and exciting, this is going to be a great conversation. If you know about this, this is going to be a great conversation. Either way, I'm so excited. Lisa, thank you for participating in Innis and being willing to share with us your interest in this topic. Well, thanks for the invitation. Really glad to be here. Absolutely. Um, could you start by giving us a little bit better idea of who you are and what drew you to this research? Yes, of course. Um, so I probably have a bit of a weird um, entry into science. Um, I did my PhD in philosophy, um, philosophy of mind. So I um, wrote my thesis about different theories about social cognition, so how people understand each other, and kind of tried to synthesize findings from philosophy, psychology, cognitive neuroscience. Um, but that was a bit lonely. And I couldn't quite get the satisfaction that I wanted out of my work. So I, um, I thought I wanted to try myself in neuroscience. And um, yeah, luckily was, was hired on a large clinical trial as a postdoc that looked into trying out a new body-based therapy against anxiety in autistic adults. And um, yeah, that was my baptism with fire. Uh, <laughs> For, for science, I plunged uh, right into it, and my my job back then was basically to run and manage the trial and to do all the all the testing and deliver the therapy. Um, and yeah, I've I've never looked back. I absolutely love it. I love working uh, with our participants and finding out more about how this um, body based therapy can help autistic people manage their anxiety better. Um, and in the team that, I, that I'm working in and that I was working in back then is uh, Dr. Jessica Eccles, who um, there's also gonna be a video with, I think. Yeah. Um, and she kept talking about joint hypermobility and how it's related to anxiety. And I was very intrigued, but also could not for the love of me, <laughs> for the life of me, understand what the connection could possibly be. And um, yeah, so now, now I'm mainly working with her because I think especially as a philosopher, this kind of, it's such a good example of how you cannot tear body and brain apart. Um, and in philosophy of mind, the big topic is how do brain and body connect? Is there a connection? What is the connection? And so I think um, this instance of, of joint hypermobility and how it just affects the entire system is just so fascinating to me that it, that's where I got stuck. When you say the connection between brain and body cannot be severed, um, you know, I think about at least here in the United States, we have um, a system of medicine that tends to separate everything. You know, if you, I'll use myself as an example. Uh, I have arthritis in my entire body but they want to break my body up into little pieces. So they want a person that does my neck, they want a person that does my shoulder, they want a person that does my hip. And um, though I can imagine specialists being a good thing, um, I also find myself constantly frustrated that there doesn't seem to be any one of them that talks to each other and none of them interested in considering me as a whole living organism uh, with my brain attached. And I find um, pushback, uh, annoyance, aggravation when I ask for that. Uh, in your research, and, and maybe you're not even touching on this, but are you finding that people, 
your, you know, your subject, your autistic humans um, frustrated about this. They're not being treated as full human beings. They're constantly having themselves separated into bits. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is one of the, of the biggest things I learned um, doing this research is that um, there is so much complexity in it. And I know from reading a lot on Twitter and being a lot in the autistic space on Twitter that the word complex has kind of become this annoying word because it's often used against autistic people because they are complex and because they are more likely to be hypermobile, they're more likely to have chronic pain, chronic fatigue and these conditions that are, they are complex, but they're also perplexing to the healthcare professionals. And we have had, I mean, all of our participants can tell a story about how they have been dismissed at the doctor's office, how they just share exactly the frustrations that you mentioned. And it's its its whole own trauma. And while, while I think that the word complex in itself um, is neutral as any other word, I can completely understand why, it, why you don't want to hear it anymore. Because it, you know, it just, it has been used against so many people and to dismiss them. And um, we are really trying to get to the bottom of this complexity. And what I really hope is that at some point we understand the connection between having a very complex body and therefore having a very complex brain, which looks like joint hypermobility and neurodivergence, understand it to the degree where we don't have to call it complex anymore and, and can just explain it and find treatments that, that take away um, the chronic pain, the chronic fatigue, the arthritis, um, or at least give, give us yeah, some um, pathways towards that. That sounds like a really happy world to me. <laughs> <laughs> I would like that world. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> next week would be awfully nice. Um, so could you, uh, if you're able, like some research is kind of like super quiet and I know nobody talks about it, but um, could you share with us some of, some of the specifics about the research that you're doing or have done if it's already published? Um, yes. I, I think I think it would be really amazing to know what you're figuring out. Yeah, so um, one thing that we have published is the results of this clinical trial, um, which are really intriguing. We found that um, this therapy that we tried out, and I will say in a minute what it actually was, um, did decrease anxiety um, better than a control condition. It was a, um, a randomized controlled clinical trial. And what we did was actually quite simple, or it does sound quite simple. So we taught autistic people um, to perceive their heartbeat more precisely. And that is based on research that we have published previously, where we found that um, in contrast to non-autistic people, aut autistic people tended to report that they feel what's going on in their body all the time, almost to a where it's quite overwhelming. All these, these signals coming to the surface of consciousness. But when you put them to um, a test where you try to get at a behavioral measure of how precisely they can feel their inner signals, they performed worse than the non-autistic. So there was this mismatch between how much they felt or how frequently they felt their bodily signals and how precise they how precisely they felt them and what we found is that the bigger this mismatch got the higher the anxiety got and so what we try to do in this clinical trial is to um, bring this mismatch back into balance by teaching autistic people to be more precise and to feel their heartbeat more precisely. And it worked, it did it decrease the anxiety, but in a very interesting finding, I think, is that we found that they didn't just get more precise or better at feeling their heartbeat, but they also scored lower on this questionnaire that measures how often and how overwhelmingly you feel your bodily signals. And that doesn't measure just the heart. That asks about, do you feel yourself sweating? Do you feel, if you, when you have to go to, go to the bathroom, 
So it kind of covers the entire body and it feels like this one thing that we taught them spread over their body and, and you know, made it less overwhelming, um, which then I think makes sense that you're a bit less anxious if, if it's not so confusing and there's not so many signals that you can't interpret. So that is what we call interoception, these signals from, from the body. And very closely related to this is um, the autonomic nervous system. So your fight and flight nervous system. And what we find is that, or what we think what happens is that if your body is very hypermobile, so your tissues are quite loose, um, because basically joint hypermobility has to do with your connective tissue being looser than normal, um, then your autonomic nervous system is also built differently. So one example that I, uh, how I explained it to myself basically, is if you think about your organs being held in place by your connective tissue. And if you're a person who does not have hypermobile joints and their connective tissue is normal, all of their intestines will always be in the same place roughly because their connective tissue holds them there. But if your connective tissue is loose, there will be much more variability in where your guts are and they can move around much more. And that, so the signals that come from your gut will also have much more variability. So your brain needs to really adapt to that much more quickly and much more often. And so that can also create more anxiety, right? That there's just so much uncertainty in where your organs are. <laughs> it's just such a basic thing. Um, and that is where, where I was like, yeah, I think that is where a big connection is. And if your body is built in a way that is not very predictable, then maybe that is why there is more neurodivergence, there is more difference in brains as well, because it's kind of a trickle-down effect. I don't know I, if I played off there, went on a tangent, but... <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm so excited. I, I, I love learning stuff that allows me to understand myself. Um, I, I am a hypermobile. Um, I am working toward getting the genetic testing for Ehlers downloads, mm -hmm. etc. Um, but uh, I have told doctors, I feel like my innards move around. <laughs> it's like I can feel them move, and they just stare at me like I am a crazy person. Mm -hmm. However, way back when I, so all my children, I have three children, they're adults now, but with my first child, two different sonograms showed my uterus in, in different, they were really confused in different places. They're really confused. Like that's very strange. Um, one, my uterus had sort of fallen behind uh, other organs and they couldn't see it properly. And the other one, it was just right out there, real easy to see. And basically they felt like something was wrong with the technology or something like that. They didn't of course, they seem to know how to process this very, very different positioning mm. of my uterus. But so you saying that I literally was getting tears in my eyes because it's so personally validating to have somebody, have somebody say, we, we know that your organs can kind of move around on you and to to understand okay my experience is valid i'm not i'm not crazy like people treat me and i think this is something that and i don't mean to discount autistic men and and yell at me in the comments if you want to it's fine but i feel like i feel like autistic women get this uh even more so than autistic men because women in general get treated as though their physical conditions may be more mental illness stress-based all of those things than anything else like somehow we couldn't possibly have a legitimate physical problem um and so that idea of brain body connection is is seen but in just the worst way in very harmful ways to us and if you add autism to the package especially for those of us who don't know yeah. Right. We can't we can't even explain ourselves because we don't know yet. And 
we, you know, we have situational nonverbal events. We have uh, a need to ask all of the questions to, and so one of the things that you were saying that exploded my brain was this idea that when you helped people understand how to connect to their heartbeat, their anxiety came down. Yeah. Um, one of my working theories uh, because of myself and my clients is autistic people, right? We know that we enjoy pattern, we enjoy repeatability, that sort of thing. I think that makes us crave information. And when we have information, I think we actually have pretty good control over our innards. We're just not taught how, how to do it. Mm -hmm. But that sort of natural ability kicks in when we get information. Yes. So by you giving the education of this is how you can know what your heart is doing, that natural ability to regulate our own bodies kicks in. And so yeah, I would imagine our stress levels come down in a lot of different ways and potentially other things within us get better because I think we are incredibly, we're, uh, maybe exceptionally brain-body connected. If we can understand it, if we can conceptualize it, if we can uh, internalize it, we can kind of become it. And there are outward expressions of that, like mirroring and mimicking and, and echoing and things like that. Um, but like, you know, part of my own theorizing about all of this is that we are exceptionally connected. We just mm. don't get trained on how to use that. And when we can't understand a thing, that's where our anxiety lives. Yes. I, I completely agree with that, yes. And I think that is also why, um, you know, when you when you think of kind of sensory overload, it's it's often kind of conceptualized as things coming in from the outside. But this finding that we had that autistic people report more often that they also feel their inner signals much more frequently than non-autistic people means that there is also kind of an internal sensory overload that um, yeah can just be j just be just as over overloading as, as anything that comes in from the outside, if not more so, because it's also harder to explain, right? Um, and oftentimes you're just not even aware of it because you don't know any different, right? Your body's always there. Can't can't turn it off like a light unless you go to sleep. But it's there's also much less control that we feel sometimes over our bodies than what we can manipulate in the environment. And we hope that with, with this therapy, we give one tool um, that works for some, at least some autistic people to give themselves something to regulate this inner overload. And is that something that is available right now or is that still tucked within your research? That's a very good question. We are trying very hard to, um, develop it into an app that is available. Um, but yeah, there is there is funding that, that we need to get and there are regulations and there are trials to be had um, to test it out to see how, how safe it is to use. Um, but we do hope that in the future it will be available to many more people. That is what we're doing it. Okay, so um, as you develop your, your funding source, options if if you end up with um something akin to crowd crowdfunding let me know and i'll make sure make sure this audience and and the rest of my audiences um know because i can imagine there are people who are like yeah i can't give you a thousand dollars but i can give you five right and <laughs> and often it is the many many contrib contributors of five five dollars five pounds whatever um five euros that uh that makes something like what you're trying to do possible. Um, That's right, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, right, right now we, we are trying to get money through the channels, you know, the, the typical um, research funding. And luckily in the UK, um, that's what I like so much about the UK is that within the National Health Service, the NHS, there's already a research path integrated so that you have just access to a lot of patients and to a lot of knowledge. And they also give give research funds, so we're trying to 
to get money from them for this. Oh, gosh, I, I hope you are listened to um, uh, between my clients and my right. online community and stuff like that, the number of people who are trying to talk about this idea of hypermobility and what it means to them uh, and their children. Um, I, I met a little one, I was at an event yesterday and I met a, a little eight-year-old and um, I, I tried to help the dad understand a little bit without being pushy that I would really recommend uh, the family looking at autism for this, for this little boy. Uh, to me, I don't know how you miss it, but um, he's not doing the things that that TV teaches you is autism, right? Um, the, what the media teaches us all is autism is so different from reality. Uh, but I was able to entertain this this little guy while I sort of took him through the hypermobility movement. Oh, nice. like, <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, you're hypermobile. Do you know what that means? Because I'm trying to give information to dad while I play with the little boy. <laughs> um, because I know what it was like for me growing up uh, and nobody understanding some of the pain I was in and how that pain yeah. continues on through adulthood. I know how my children who are also hypermobile had pain as children and that is carrying through into their adult life. And now that I'm understanding what it is, I'm desperately seeking people who get it in the medical community. And it's why I got so excited about talking to you and to Laura, who, yes, you know, will also have a, a, a video like this um, as part of Innis. I just feel like this is one of those things that is really misunderstood, under understood, if that makes it right. <laughs> yes. People who don't seem to know. My primary care doctor had no idea. No. Never heard of it, had no idea. And, and that is not to criticize them. It's simply to bring out this idea that here in the United States, uh, neurodivergence is either minimally taught or not taught at all in our medical schools at any level. And so any of the co-occurring uh, comorbidity type of things um, aren't acknowledged in our medical schools. We're not looking at these things in our education and somebody has to be awakened to these things, right? It has to come across their path in order for them to start following the research. So by far, most physicians, nurses, therapists, psychiatrists, et cetera, really, they simply don't know. So how are we supposed to get good care? Um, are you finding as you talk to more people and you, you know, you're the idea that you're doing this research is sort of seeping out into the world. Are you finding um, connections where you can help disseminate this information? You can get this more out into the world. I mean, I'm going to do everything I can to get as many people watching this talk, but this talk is only going to do so much, right? How do we get the word more out? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think it is it is a growing thing. Um, and what I know from what is happening locally at the, at the university that I work at is that um, there's a program called Time for Autism. Um, and as part of that, we have a wonderful autistic woman who has founded um, an advocacy and support group for Alzheimer's syndrome and hypermobility um, in Sussex and she is now part of the curriculum she's teaching medical students about autism joint hypermobility and everything they have also developed a toolkit for schools that is freely available where they teach about what to look out for when children seem to be in pain and there is you know not a very obvious source for that and how you can adjust classrooms um, to make it more comfortable for these kids. And so locally, um, I see a lot of, of really good things happening that I hope can then be adapted um, once we have proven that they, that they work and that they do good. And, um, but, I, but I feel like there is, people are, it's also not something you forget about. Like once you've heard about it, it's so strange. It's like hypermobile joints and neurodivergence, what, 
what is going on here? It's not something you forget about again, I think. Um, so we have that on our side. And I think people are getting more curious about it and want to learn more about it. So I think we just have to keep doing the research, which unfortunately not many people do yet. Um, but I do get the sense that it's a growing thing and that more and more interest is, is growing, especially in the autistic community. And I hope that in the future, autism research is going to be much more influenced by autistic people and hopefully they can bring in some of that um, interest in this topic. And that's something your, your research group is working toward all the time, right? Including as many autistic people as you can in the design and development and, and actual work of the research, right? Yeah, yeah, we, we are trying. And the big problem that um, everyone who is trying, because we're definitely not the only ones, there are many out there who do, is that it is really hard to get funding for having, you know, for paying people who put their work and effort and, and time into helping us with our research. But what we want to do in the future, and um, yes, yeah, it's, it's nothing official yet, but our future plan is to kind of turn the traditional model around. So the traditional model is that the researcher has an idea, they think this is important, so they work it out a little, and then they have um, some public and patient involvement or lived experience advisory panels where they have three autistic people and they give them their opinion, and then the researchers go their way. And that is often all we can do in terms of paying people and, and costs. And um, while this is already you know, on the right path, what we want to do is that the autistic community gives us the ideas, they conceive of what is important to them, and we help them turn it into research. Um, I think there was just the other day a paper out, um, I think from Liz Pelicanus group in Australia, showing that most autistic people think about research, that there is a power dynamic against them, that they are in less power. Um, and I think the more radically we can change that and try to include autistic people with all abilities and all strengths and all support needs as much as possible at every stage of research and not just tokenistic at some point where we get a little bit of money, that should really be the future. And there are now models in the UK where you can get funding for such a model, and we will be trying our very hardest to, to get to that pot of money to be able to, to try it out and do it and find the best ways to do it. And I, I really see the future of autism research there because we need this not only because it's the right thing to do and because it will lead to better, more meaningful research, but also to heal some of the trauma that um, especially clinical neuroscience has, has done to the autistic community. Because there have been so many findings that have been interpreted and have gotten kind of even famous that are now held against the autistic community. If you think about the extreme male brain hypothesis, um, which says that the autistic brain systematizes more than it empathizes, which supposedly is a male feature, um, or a broken mirror neuron system, where you have broken mirrors in your brain because the mirror neuron, system, mirror neuron system is a system that fires both when we observe an action or do an action ourselves. So a lot of people have said it's kind of the neurological basis for empathy. I mean, that itself is controversial. But then to say that this is broken in autistic people, you can just see how much stigmatizing stereotypes will come out of such research. And of course, the autistic community wouldn't trust researchers if they have done so much damage and harm. And so I think we just really need to get some of that trust back by giving the control over to the autistic community and reversing the roles here. And that is what we hope to be doing in the future. But like I said, it, it, takes, it takes time to change structures that are already there and it takes money because we do want to pay the people who give us their time and effort. Um, but hopefully it's something we can report more about in the future. Do you think that some of uh, 
some of these misconceptions come from, so my personal belief about autism, ADHD, other neurodivergent types is that these are uh, valid and appropriate human development neurotypes. They are not in and of themselves uh, deficient or disabled uh, or diseased. Um, and so again, a theory I have is that when researchers are looking at autism, they're tending to look more at co-occurring disabilities and labeling them as autism and misunderstanding uh, what is actually the autistic brain type, neurotype. Mm -hmm. uh, and so coming out with, with results that aren't accurate, it would, it would be a little bit like, um, you know, if you have an internal, uh, like misunderstanding uh, a digestive issue as mm -hmm. in one part of the digestion instead of another. And if you don't look at the whole digestion as a whole system, you can be misunderstanding what's going on and and overcompensate in one area, which makes another area worse. And I feel like that's what's happening with us as autistic people when we're not involved in the research. Um, mm -hmm. Additionally, though, I feel like the PhD academ academia model of research limits who's involved. And that is not at all to discount the beautiful work of academia or to minimize the the effort it takes to gain a PhD or anything like that. I am not speaking negatively whatsoever, but what I am suggesting is that it has it has accidentally become so insular that we have all of these brilliant minds that maybe school, they're not designed for school. Yeah. But school is the is the only doorway right now to be involved in research. It's part of why I did Innis. I wanted to remove every single boundary possible mm. to being involved in this information, involved in this conversation. I don't care if you dropped out when you were 16 years old, but you have lived experience, right? And you've read and you've read some of these folks that, that have a seeming uh, dearth in formalized education, <laughs> have put in the work of multiple PhDs, right? Of they course, yes. Validating institution. So how do we, how do we open the doors uh, in a way that makes sense within the current system? Because the incurrence, the current system is going to understandably protect itself. Yes. Right? You must have a PhD, you must have this course working, right? And the, there are understandable and legitimate reasons for that, but we're missing too much, to, in my opinion, too much from the community out there that may not have reached that level of education that would benefit research and benefit uh, not just the neurodivergent community, but everyone, if we could find ways to open those doors to a broader participation base. I come. I completely agree. Absolutely. And um, what I think, what I—that's also what I mean when I say we really have to put it, the whole system on its head, and um, have to go into the community and ask people there, and not invite them, you know, to campus in a in a stuffy room. And I think what we first need to find out is how do we do that, and where do we do that, and that will of course vary. But I think we can only find it out if we include as many autistic people as we can possibly pay <laughs> and have there um, and ask them and try to find all kinds of different communication formats where we can gather this information because the communication differences and needs are so broad in the autistic community. I think that's one reason why so many of them can't fit into academia. But they're just as valid, right? I mean, just because you 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 would rather text than speak, you still have something to say. So, um, I'm I'm working with a fantastic group of, of autistic people who are researchers, doctors, just members of the public, 
Um, and we're trying to find as many different communication formats as possible to include as many people as possible and to meet with them where they are in the community, in community centers, or, you know, we have um, the idea of, of setting up a, a text chat group where you just, you just text um, or having an online forum, or, you know, if, if people prefer to talk in their own home, then we go there. And I think there's just a flexibility needed and a willingness to, to come out of our offices in the university and go to where the people are. I think that's just what, what's needed. We just really need to be open to new suggestions and listen to autistic people, what they tell us, what they need from us to make it happen. And be really clear that in that case, the researchers are not the experts, but you are the expert. And I mean, I, I honestly think if you do a PhD and you get a PhD, you have proven that you can focus on a topic for a long time and put a lot of hours in and that's what gets you a title. And I mean, of course, it's great to do a PhD and, and there are so many smart people who do it. And I don't want to like talk it down, but at the same time, it's also something that, you know, if other experiences are just as valid and as, and as, as valuable. So it's one skill set. It's one of the things I've been exactly. thinking about long before uh, I recognized my identity as a neurodivergent person. How do we help employ people whose brilliance comes in their ability to think? So they're that person in the meeting that sits there quietly and listens to everyone and they're just putting it all in their beautiful brain and they'll say like that one thing in the meeting and everybody's jaw drops, right? The problem is, is that if they cannot also make the spreadsheet and do the 40 hour week and right, they're, they're not only invalidated, but they're not even hired. Um, and so I've been thinking possibly forever because I've just been tuned into people who think and do differently my whole life. Um, everybody's missing so much when they don't invite thinkers and, and uh, synthesizers into their spaces as that being their primary reason for existing. You're here so that your gorgeous brain can come up with something because you've been near everybody. Right. All you need to do is be near everybody and you'll be like, oh, yeah, I have an idea and it'll probably be brilliant. Right. Or at least one out of five will be. Um, and you're what you're talking about in terms of how you invite people into the research perspectives. It, it's it sounds to me like you would be inviting of people who do not have uh, such obvious currently socially or academically acceptable skill sets but they have really valid and useful skill sets we just have we just haven't figured out how to use them yet yeah we want to invite everyone who is interested in in you know research if what we do is interesting to them then they are valuable to us and i mean everyone everyone else too but these are the people who can who can come to us with whatever support needs they have and we want to try and make it happen of course within the societal structural and financial boundaries that there will be um i wish i could open it up to to every single person um but it's hopefully going to be we're going to try out new ways and we hope that we can then tell others about it so they can try it out as well. And um, like I said, we're not the only group doing that. There are many, many groups that are finding new ways of, of integrating autistic people in their research. And I believe that this is truly the future. And the more we try out, the more we find out and the more we can share what we have found out on how we can make it more meaningful to autistic people so that the research that we do is 
truly with them and for them and not just some random person's interest because they've watched an episode of Grey's Anatomy with an autistic boy. Yeah, or uh, here in the United States, we have a program uh, called The Good Doctor. And Oh, yeah, uh, I've seen that. <laughs> um, though I appreciate the effort, uh, it's, it's still uh, misrepresents and minimizes the autistic experience. Um, yeah. I, I try to keep myself encouraged by saying all press is good press, um, but not always, not always, not always. <laughs> Not always, no. And I think that is something fundamental that, that the world misunderstands about the autistic community is that they think there this is this like kind of homogenous thing that okay, maybe there's a bit of a spectrum, so you can be either super weird or just a little bit weird. But in reality, we're just as diverse as, as the non-autistics and the neurotypicals. I mean, they get sick, they have disabilities. You know, they're introverts and extroverts, and the same spectrum of humanity exists in autistic people. And I think that's something that a lot of people just get fundamentally wrong about autism. Is that it's you can be anything as an autistic person. You can be the most loveliest person, you can be, you know, the very nasty person. And just because you're autistic doesn't change the possibilities of, of what you can be. Yeah, the the spectrum of humanness. I think is is a better perspective than a spectrum of autism. Yes. Um, this the idea that autism is a spectrum. I think tries to uh, subcategorize humanity, mm -hmm. and just like you said, we all of us, all of us have potential for good and not so good, right? Grumpiness, happiness, right? We, we have all of it. And so when we try to spectrumize autism, we ignore almost everything about the human experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then try to, try to do stuff about that. And, uh, you know, our, our farming communities do not grow corn or wheat and ignore the needs of corn or wheat, right? They, <laughs> there's so much science and research and stuff gone into producing food and we get it, water this type this much and that type that much, sun this much for that, right? We get it, every, every different plant, every different animal, we get it, they all need different things. We do not try to feed our, our cats and dogs the same. Right, we do not, we don't give our plants and animals identical treatment because we know better now. We used to, but we know better now. Yeah. We now have highly specialized diets for different breeds of everything, right? You do yeah. not grow a cactus and a, you know, a fern the same way. We know better now. And then we entirely ignore that when it comes to how we're trying to process what it is to be human yeah. and and to to understand uh physiologically mentally all of it each individual human experience yeah. um you know we know that an oak tree planted in maine is going to grow differently than an oak tree planted in arizona we know it they're both oak trees their environment is different, right? We get it, we know it, we understand it, and yet we ignore it when it comes to humans. Yeah. Um, and then we doubly ignore it when it comes to the neurodivergent community. Yeah. Uh, we insist the oak tree in Arizona grow identically to the oak tree in Maine. We insist upon it. And if it won't cooperate, we cut it down. That's the treatment of the neurodivergent community. If you do not thrive where you are planted, you are the problem. We don't treat anything else on this planet like that. No, that's very true. That's one of my favorite um, tweets that I, um, I once asked many, many years ago. Well, not that many, maybe five. Um, I asked for um, tweets from autistic people because I was about to give my first talk at an international conference about loneliness and autistic people and asked them, what do you want me to tell 
the researchers in the room about autism, what do you want them to know? And one said that, um, that just like a cat is not a def defective dog, an autistic person is not a defective person. And I love that because it's just so true. It's like, I would never, you know, ask my, my dog to be a cat, although she can be quite cat-like. Um, so why do we try to, to, you know, push autistic people into this mold that we have, which doesn't even exist in neurotypical people? It's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's quite sad sometimes. It is. But people like you doing the work that you're doing, helping to make things better. And I am so grateful. Lisa, this has been an amazing conversation. I wish it could be longer. Um, and I hope we have opportunity to work together in the future. If you have any social media presence or you just mentioned Twitter, right? Send me whatever so that people can follow what it is you're doing and, and maybe help what it is you're doing. Um, and just know that uh, I and the Innis conferences are always going to be cheering you on. If there's anything I can be doing for you, you let me know. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And I had a lot of fun talking.